A quick disclaimer, opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. For our season finale, we bring you the remarkable story of Steve Cairns. Steve suffered a stroke and had brainstem surgery in the spring of 2017. Based on his movement background, he elected to rehab himself. This is an inspiring story of the human spirit and how he defied all odds on the journey to recovery. To give the full story, we are presenting the season finale in two parts. This week, part one. I sit down with Steve and get the details of what happened. In part two, Gray and Lee continue the conversation and dive deeper into how this was possible and what it may unlock for future brain injury patients. So let's get going with today's incredible episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. Steve, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, I was made aware of your story uh, within the past year, and I have devoured every piece of media I can find on the internet on it because I find it so compelling and impressive and just really amazing. So um, we're excited to have you on here today to to talk about it further. Um, just to get into it a little bit, we you know, we understand that you were a regimental um, training instructor for the British Army. And so you yeah. have this physical education background and, and training these special forces groups. Um, and so by a twist of fate in 2017, you really came across something that, you know, no one would have expected. Um, so could you maybe dive deeper and tell us a little bit more about what happened in the spring of 2017? I had a a cavernoma, which is a, a, a tumor or a, a vascular malformation. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was on my brainstem, which is probably just about the worst place you, you, you're going to get it. From an evolutionary point of view, the, the brainstem is the oldest part of the brain. And it's also the most eloquent. So it's least able to sustain damage. And any damage it does sustain is, is more far reaching. So I was preparing for... Um, it's quite a big deal presentation. Um, and as, as usual, preparation was, was wonderful. So I was, I was up till about uh, three in the morning creating this presentation. Um, didn't finish it. Got my head down to sleep uh, to, to then wake up again at, at six to prepare it for nine o'clock. You know, I, I usually sleep the sleep of the damned, you know, I did head on the pillow, sleep in 30 seconds and then, you know, wake up when I'm supposed to. But it had a shocking night's sleep. And I suppose I just put it down to maybe the, the pressure of this presentation I was going to mm -hmm. give. I was, I was in this presentation and seminar all, all day. It was in a, a real closed room. Um, and by the end of the day, I, I just felt awful. I had, I had these real rings of tiredness, uh, around my eyes. Uh, we've we been in, we were in Birmingham in the, in the UK. Uh, and I was going back to Liverpool. Um, which anyone who's got a keen ear for accents can probably tell us where I'm from. Um, and so I, I got drove back there and although I never experienced tiredness like it before, I shut my eyes and there wasn't any, any impact by sleeping or rest. I just had these mm -hmm. huge panda eyes of, of tiredness. I think I'd mentioned earlier about the, the sequence of things not to do when you, when you have a stroke. I had arranged to meet up with a really good friend of mine who I haven't seen for about 10 years. So we were going out for a few beers. Yeah. Yeah. And because I hadn't seen him for 10 years, I couldn't cancel last minute. So I went out with him for, uh, for a few beers that night. I uh, was feeling awful. Uh, so I thought a, a good way to deal with it would be to get up early and go to the gym. So got up early, went to the gym, and I was, I was feeling bad. In the gym, I was squatting, deadlifting, you know, some 
quite high threshold stuff. I mean, I, I never do max lifting. Mm-hmm. Uh, always look for quality in whatever gym-based movement I'm doing. But I was doing a single leg deadlift and I, I couldn't maintain my balance. And I just went, oh, I'm stopping, stopping this session now. Thought that having a spell in the sauna might sweat it out. <laughs> Which obviously then just put my blood pressure even further up. Um, and my brain stems bleeding all, all of this time. Despite being from Liverpool, I live in Bristol, which is the other end of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was then on a train back home to Bristol, feeling bad. Got home, asleep on the sofa immediately. Uh, and then I can remember distinctly, we had a delivery of a bed the next morning, again at seven o'clock. So no sleep once more. And the guys delivered it. I asked him if he wanted any help bringing it in. He said they'd be fine. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God for that, because it got felt bad on the settee. And then after that, I couldn't get up. I was, mm-hmm. I was vomit, vomiting, double vision. Started having trouble walking then. And what at the time seemed to be the worst symptom of all was intractable hiccups that were just driving me nuts. And those hiccups stayed with me for about three days. Was there pain involved or you just felt tired? Um, No, it felt awful. I had had a headache. It was like the worst hangover from hell that I I had in the end, you know. Um, And then the bouts of sickness, it was sort of nausea with it. But I I don't particularly remember pain, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as as you'd associate with spinal pain or or neck pain or anything like Mm -hmm. that, or maybe even... a, a splitting headache. It just it was just felt bad. Yeah. Now, obviously, because of my medical skills, I was always self-assessing. It was evident was saying to me, "This, this is this is you know brain injury." Uh, I'm thinking that can't be brain injury, you know. And you always explain it in a way, and you know, like like any guy, I'm always reluctant to go to the doctors. And so that that was on on the Friday. And it was actually to my eternal shame the the, the Monday when I, I went down the doc got taken the doctors couldn't walk into the uh, treatment room and then it was it was straight to hospital then. So you just went to a regular physician or you went to an yeah, emergency uh, room? Uh, regular physician first, and then she just went yeah you're off to hospital. And I was fortunate enough that the the hospital local to me is a centre of excellence for neurosurgery and neurology in the southwest of the UK. So wow. yeah, I went to the perfect place. Oh, there's just a catalogue of, uh, of of lucky um, things, which and you know, and also my my history, which almost made it seem like predetermination. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was immediately seen. I was then uh, I was given a scan. And I, I can remember, I, I was in the, I was in, in my room, I was put straight into the hospital room and I could see two doctors coming towards the room and their body language was shocking. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, stand by, Steve, this, this ain't going to be good news, Ugh. you know? But, you don't know what they're going to say. And then yeah. they, they tell you your diagnosis. Yeah. Well, what did that feel like? Well, it, it, they, they couldn't give me the diagnosis straight away. Yeah, I had a CAT scan, a okay. CT scan, come into the room and uh, the first doctor says, right, can you, you talk me through your symptoms? And I thought, you know exactly my symptoms. This is a conversation starter for, for delivering some bad news. And she said, we, we found something we, we don't like and we're going to have to go down for a, an MRI to find out exactly what it is. Now, my mum uh, died of a, uh, of a brain tumour, cancerous one. Mm. And so when I heard that, it, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to mm. find out what's going on here. And that, a real sharp bout of fear just gripped me in the stomach, which, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, my ego was a little bit offended by it, thinking I should be able to deal with these things. But then I went, right, I've, I've got two hours and it's possibly going to be, you know, me last two hours on the planet without cancer because until he tells me, yeah. <laughs> I haven't got it. Um, and so uh, the MRI and then the guy come up with the results. And I, I don't think he, he was in the loop previously and he was just delivering the results. So he thought he was delivering really bad news. He was sort of saying, I'm afraid you've had a, had a brain hemorrhage. 
you know, which has resulted in a significant stroke. And I'm like, that, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, no, this is really bad news. I said, it's not, mate. This no. is great news. <laughs> this leaves me with a chance, you know? Um, well, so, I'm sure yeah. you left an impression on him that day too, <laughs> thinking he's delivering this this tragic news. And to you, you can see, all right, there's there's a light at the end of the tunnel of this possibly. Yeah. And, and, and that was sort of, uh, recovery started there. It was right. Mm-hmm. Get your mindset sorted. You you can you can do something about this. How amazing! Um, because of the, the the way we we changed the the, the training regime uh, and the, and in my military career because of the the really poor results they were getting, mm-hmm. and then we we came from this movement pattern driven approach, and and then the set success we had, and then I followed that up. Um, I went. I came over to to rally in 2014. Mm-hmm. Did uh, FMS one and two, and then also the Perform Better Summit. And there was within the Perform Better, there was some presentations around the neural development sequence in there, mm-hmm. which just built I mean knowledge and interest in it further. Uh, and I honestly used to wonder why they didn't rehab brain injury patients this way, and obviously thought about it a little bit too hard. <laughs> and uh, you know, the big man said, "Oh, there you go, mate." <laughs> how I was going to say, you know, in a twist of fate, how how quickly did you make that connection? Was it before you had surgery, where you kind of knew where you where you would take this or what you wanted to do with it, or was it in the weeks prior when you weren't getting results? Well, I, yeah, no, I I'd, um, I, I, I was hospitalized from my stroke right up to my surgery, mm-hmm. um, and I, after the stroke, I, I couldn't walk uh, amongst numerous other symptoms. Um, and it, it was it was there, and then I, I got my wife to bring me exercise mat in, and I was on the hospital floor, uh, rolling and crawling, and and going through the, the neural development sequence. I mean, I, I used to I used to start as as part of my warm up for every single session. I would do a neural development sequence warm up, and wow. and so that that was just exactly what 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 I did. I mean, and that, that would be one of the, the big advantages I had over, over somebody else who we might use these techniques to try to rehab is that I don't need to be uh, taught them when I've already got a brain compromise, which is going to increase the challenge. And in, in the two weeks in which I was hospitalized, on, on the morning of the, the stroke, I, I felt that that was when uh, I was able to walk. I mean, I previously had some sort of compromised ambulation pattern I'd, I'd progressed it to but on the morning of the surgery uh, I, w- I was doing what I felt was a fairly authentic walking pattern and then he went right let's, <laughs> let's take that back <laughs> I had uh, 10 and a half hours of, of brain surgery mm-hmm. and you know, I, I think the, 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 the brain stem is really difficult to, to get, get access to uh, and then obviously Anything which gets damaged along the way has really far-reaching impact. But but even then, of of the sort of uh, communities I've, I've uh, been part of ever since, the the average amount of surgery time seems to be between two and four hours. Oh. But yeah, that, I was under for for ten and a half. And so it, it's usually a a good rule of thumb for the extent of the uh, surgery induced compromise you'll have is, is the amount of time you're under the knife. Uh, so I had the ten and a half, and I it proper knocked me sideways. Um, I, I couldn't even crawl after after the surgery. I think I had two days in uh, in high dependency intensive care, uh, and then I was transferred to a private room. And it was once in the private room, I, I started to say, "Okay, I'm going to go through the process again," mm-hmm. and I I managed to. I clambered out of bed, holding onto the to the bed rail, and then get on the, on the floor. The rolling was, you know, it was, <laughs> I had to be a little bit careful because I had a bit of a right. scar <laughs> and and some uh, some trauma around there. But I was able to to do some form of of rolling, and I was able to get on all fours. Mm-hmm. But the the idea of, of being able to move and move one of those limbs, it it, it just it wasn't, wasn't a program. Uh, I, I was just going to faceplant. And the most remarkable thing, I could actually feel gravity. 
I, I could feel myself being sucked to the floor. Mm-hmm. It, I, I obviously just had zero core stability at the, right. at the most innate level. And I, I don't know if, if you can, like if you get on one of those spinning, spinning tops and you get centrifugal force pulling you out, uh-huh. it, it was exactly that feeling getting sucked to the floor. I thought, oh, this, is, this is interesting. <laughs> so to go back, you go through this 10 and a half hours worth of surgery. What was the conversation the doctors had with you post-op? What, what were their expectations? I, I'm guessing they had seen you rolling around the, <laughs> the hospital floor in yeah. the days prior. So did they have better expectations for you or were they pretty blanket? This is what we see in these patients and this is probably where you're going to end up. In the NHS, there is there's such a, a sort of turnover of, of, of both staff day to day, you know, it's sort of shift pattern wise that, you know, you don't get the, you don't get the same guy each time. Uh, so obviously your notes are all, are all down there. And an interesting one I, I will throw in is that from the stroke, um, my, my sort of split stance pattern was, was shot to bits, but I did seem to retain my symmetrical pelvis. Uh, pattern, mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, for a squat. And the day before the surgery, I had a um, uh, an assessment by a physio and, and a doctor. Uh, and, you know, they would take me through their standard assessment. And I, I was sort of saying, you know, I was trying to engage with it, which you know, obviously you <laughs> never appreciate do they? Um But I was sort of wanted to show them what I, I could and couldn't do. Uh, and of the three of us in the room, only one of us could do a deep squat. <laughs> and guess who that was? <laughs> it was you. <laughs> now, yeah. So what, what, a, what a statement that is on sort of standard day-to-day movement. How, you know, especially for the, the physio, which was relatively young um, and certainly looked quite athletic, probably thought she was. And by comparison to most people, they probably thought she was really fit. Right. But she couldn't do a deep squat. And the doctor, forget about it. He couldn't get anywhere near it. <laughs> um, but to, to then go on to answer your question afterwards, the, the prognosis was for a, a two to three year recovery with, with permanent deficits. And that's years. Yeah. Yeah, years. And a likelihood of, uh, of to need an adjunct for, for walking, be it a cane, a zimmer, um, whatever. Uh, I mean, I was in a wheelchair for all of the mm-hmm. time I was in hospital thereafter if I, I needed to, to move about. When I'd, I'd sort of started getting myself walking, this is prior to the, prior to the, uh, the surgery, I had a, a physio session in there. But what I was trying to, trying to do is, is obviously when you start trying to cognitively control your movement, straight away it's mm-hmm. complex. And then that, that can be a difficult thing when, when you've lost movement, you know, to, to sort of, get out of your own way right. with, with, with trying to control it and just trying to let it flow. But that was what I was trying to do because I was trying to get a, an accurate insight to where everything was. And so this, this uh, physio had me trying to walk and I, <laughs> I got the, the best backhanded compliment I've ever received in my life where afterwards she said, you know, I've never seen someone whose movement was so bad walk with such confidence. <laughs> And I, I, I tried to, to discuss with them my ideas about the, the neural development sequence mm-hmm. and, and, you know, fostering mobility uh, before you start trying to teach skills. And, you know, it, it, was, it was just falling on, on deaf ears. And so at, at that point, I, went, I, you know, I was in a, a high-sided hospital bed, uh, which is, is great for looking after you and stuff and you're falling out. Mm-hmm. But if you're wanting to get on the floor and, and start you know, trying to drive primitive movement, then it, it's just a barrier. Mm-hmm. And the longer I would, I'm just staying in bed, I'm, I'm just seizing up. And obviously, bear in mind, at that, at that point, I'd had the best part of three weeks with, with mm-hmm. a really limited movement lifestyle. So, you know, things that, you know, just going backwards. So I, I signed myself out of hospital, unable to walk and said, Thanks, but no thanks. I'll take it from here. <laughs> yeah. So, so what what did the next step look like? I, I I see that you refused your your rehab that I'm guessing the hospital yeah. would have provided for you. So, what did that end up looking like? 
Uh, it was seven days post-surgery mm-hmm. and I was able to sort of stand upright. And then if I had either an adjunct or, or something that would mitigate chance mm-hmm. of failure, I, I could sort of shuffle on, on my feet and do a bit of a Robbie the Robot walk. So I, I feel, uh, filmed that when I first walked through the door and then I resolved I was not going to try to walk again until I'd gained competency in all of the, the primitive patterns because it, it would only start building skills that I didn't want to be in there, which would then potentially get in the way. So thereafter, I was just rolling and crawling and, and trying to increase my mobility. If I was in one room, wanted to go to, I don't know, make myself a brew in the kitchen, I would crawl to the kitchen. Um, I, even during nighttime, if I needed to go to the toilet, I would get up, I would, I would crawl to the bathroom. And it would even go into bed, I would crawl from the living room, up the stairs and, mm-hmm. and to my bedroom. The best form of, of, of movement rehab is, is a living, your recovery. You know, rather than, you know, just be given a, a suite of, of bland and isolated exercises. If you, if you've got a reason to move, that, that engages the whole, whole system. That engages hardware and software. You see them trying to rehab uh, brain injury patients, putting them in, in weight machines. And yeah, you can't use your legs anymore. So let's get some big muscles on the legs. But those, those, those muscles were sufficient to let them walk the day before the brain injury. Right. It, it's not muscle mass, which is the issue here. If you, you live in your recovery, you get that full engagement. But that's also how we're designed to learn our movements so that you get all sorts of bonus extras thrown in. For instance, if you crawl over to, to, to get something, uh, and even the television control, you'll crawl over to it and then you'll go up onto your knees to, you know, to free up your hands. But then in doing so, you, you're on a vertical pelvis. You're standing on two legs, two very short legs, admittedly, but that, <laughs> that reduced height reduces the center of gravity, which is a reduced right. challenge. And so you're learning all of these skills in a, a reduced challenge environment. And I, I didn't come up with this. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is week one, day one human race. This is how mm-hmm. everyone has, has learned these skills. And it, it, it seems bizarre that, that no one sort of thought, well, hang on, all of this has worked before for everyone. Why don't we give it a go again? As a thank you for supporting the podcast, FMS is offering an exclusive discount of 30% off our Fundamental Capacity Screen online course. So if you're FMS certified, this deal's for you. And if you're not FMS certified, go get certified, and this deal's for you. In this course, you'll learn how to get your clients and athletes on the most efficient path to optimal performance. We cover the four key components of fitness, how to test these components, and strategies for correcting and conditioning. You'll receive over two hours of video instruction, the FCS manual, and after you pass the exam, you'll access a free year of FMS Pro membership, including the FMS Pro app. Please note that the FMS Level 1 certification is a prerequisite to the FCS certification. To receive 30% off your FCS course today, use promo code FCSPOD30 at checkout. That's FCS pod 30 at checkout. For more details, follow the link in the description of this episode and get started on your course today. Now let's get back to the podcast. In those first couple weeks, what were maybe a, a success story that you remember one, a moment that you, you really knew it was working or uh, this, this made me feel good about the, the path that I had chosen? Yeah, good, good question. I can think of a few more a little bit further down the line. But, you know, the, I can remember I, I started getting a, a desire to walk, um, you know, near the end of those 14 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't aware if that was just, you know, through boredom and inconvenience <laughs> having to crawl or whether that was an innate recognition that those, mm-hmm. those skills were there. And so, you know, walking then, that, that was good. But I'd already had in the the recovery from the stroke. Right. I mean, I mean, I, I'd, I had total belief that, that this was going to work anyway. Um, I had the reinforcements of, of it having worked in between the stroke and surgery. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I didn't have a doubt. Um, 
it's, 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 it's an unfortunate reflection on, on some aspects of my personality that I was relishing the opportunity to prove that I was right. You know, you, you can, can probably ask my wife about that aspect of, of my personality, you know, but I, I, you know, I did, I, I, I relished the opportunity. I, I was, I, I was violently positive about, uh, and that was, that was part of deliberate reframing as well. Um, I've done a, a lot of, um, a lot of running, a lot of distance running, et cetera, in, in, in the past. For the, like, the previous six years prior to me, me surgery, uh, I'd had a lot of, of problems with me running that I just couldn't get to the bottom of. Mm-hmm. And I'd sort of resolved that I thought I'd just, uh, the majority of that running had probably been done before I, w- I was more aware of the, um, all, all of the, the, the FMS details, the whole, the, the elegance of it all, but also mm-hmm. the sim- that simple, simple complexity, that simple elegance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hadn't fitted all of the, all of the pieces together. Um, and so I, I had come, you know, my running technique was like something out of the Lord of the Rings, you know, but I, I, I had, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I had a, a lot of determination and I did a lot of, in, I did a lot of intelligent prep, you know, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I learned the, you know, the, the lesson about just, just, you know, more and harder doesn't necessarily mean better. I learned that reasonably early. Um, and so the training in what, you know, the, the FMS tribe might recognize as, you know, a, a reasonably intelligent way. But I, I thought I'd just ingrained flawed patterns too deeply and I just couldn't seem to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So I actually saw all of my movement skills being taken away. I saw it as an opportunity. I, mm-hmm. I could re- rebuild my, my movement map from absolute scratch and, right. and no excuses. It was all down to me if, if anything was right or wrong. Well, so, uh, there's, there's no doubt you, you came to this in a, an abnormal situation, you know, with your mm-hmm. background and education and that determination as well. Um, yeah. Could you recognize any pitfalls that maybe you had that, you know, in, in someone else who, who has needed to progress through this type of recovery. Um, can you recognize any pitfalls that you had that maybe they would have as well? You know, I would, I would assume that like you said, you had that pull to walk that these days were probably fairly long <laughs> crawling yeah. you know, getting from place to place. And so I would imagine that, um, the weeks that this took there, there were moments of, of emotions or feelings, or, or like I said, pitfalls. Could you, you know, maybe take us back to any of those? Neuro fatigue does does present quite quite heavily so the, the days didn't actually seem that long because you know the opportunities to rest were sort of gratefully taken mm-hmm. you know uh, and especially at the start you know that the smallest sort of rehab session would you, you know you'd get the deepest tiredness to send on you um and so you were grateful for them and for the, the whole three weeks in, in hospital for instance I don't remember being being bored uh, once. I remember being in pain. <laughs> that's, that's that's not very not very boring. Um, I, I can remember some some feelings of is, is this as good as it gets, mm-hmm. and and that being a, a little daunting. But you know, I, I just immediately wanted to to banish them. In a little way, it's a part of my natural approach or approach which has been fostered over um, the last 20 years or so. That I, I just went, look, it, it, it doesn't matter where I am on, on this journey. I am going to be getting, I'm going to be restored to full movement. Mm-hmm. Now, on, on things like that, I, I, can't, I can't bullshit myself and, and tell myself magic. But, but I did have the... The belief in what I thought was, you know, was rock solid science. And, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I think that uh, the classic model that gets used, I think that's bad science. So I had that real belief in it, and I thought, well, if I'm if I'm not there yet, I'm just going to make tomorrow's me better than today's me. Mm-hmm. You know, you get a lot of people will start becoming not so much goal fixated, but sort of outcome fi- fixated mm-hmm. and milestone fixated. And it's no, I'm just going to make each, you know, going to make tomorrow, tomorrow's me better than right. today's. And if, if, you know, if I wasn't 
uh, if I haven't hit the milestone yet, well, guess what? I'm going to make tomorrow's me better than today. And if I do hit that, yeah, and if I do hit that milestone, if I get back to full movement, well, guess what I'm going to do then? I'm, I'm going to make tomorrow's me better than today. I'm still going to keep building on that. Uh, so that, that was, that was how I reframed it. Would you believe I had, a, remember I had a nurse trying to, trying to cancel me down from the expectations. You know, I'm sure she's a lovely, lovely woman and, mm-hmm. you know, the best of intentions, but I'm sorry, I don't need to hear that of, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, thanks for your advice. And I know it's well meant, but it, this is going somewhere else. This. So you, you come home, you start, mm-hmm. you start crawling, you uh, get to a half kneeling position. Um, you eventually, you know, you're standing at a portion. So what, what is the timeline there? Like how, how did the rest of that timeline work for you? I was due to do a rock climb of Mount Kenya um, <laughs> in, uh, yeah, in, in, in the July. Um, and so uh, me, my wife, my daughter have different tastes in holidays. <laughs> so, so during that time, they, they were scheduled to, to be going on a cruise around the Mediterranean, uh, and I was going out to East Africa. Uh, well, you know, as you can tell, that was no longer on the cards. <laughs> so, you know, the, the backup, you know, uh, they, they managed to find me, um, you know, we got a bigger cabin, and I, I got on the cruise because I, I couldn't be left to, to look after myself, even though I w- was progressing quite rapidly. So that, that was... Um, that was eight weeks uh, okay. post-surgery um, and I, I was walking by that stage uh, possibly to the extent where, where if someone didn't know or didn't suspect they wouldn't have thought I had uh, a, a brain injury mm-hmm. um, and then on the, on the cruise ship they, they had a well-equipped gym and they also had a climbing wall I hadn't done any training with my hands overhead at that stage um, not intentionally it just hadn't sort of, you know, just hadn't been in what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was, uh, whenever I encountered a new movement, a wholly new movement, I would get a taxi and the hands would, would, mm-hmm. would shake. Uh, I would, would still have had problem touching a finger to a point that as I got near it, the finger would start mm-hmm. giving it one of them. Uh, and that was the first time I found out that so rigged up on the climbing wall and then the hand goes over my head and, Everything starts shaking, um, but I was just able to to build me patterns on there. And by the end of the by the end of the, the two weeks, um, by the end of the two weeks, I actually climbed a, a, a route on there that the member of the staff who ran the climbing wall couldn't climb. <laughs> but you know that that's a little overstated that because he wasn't a climber. Uh, he was just one of the staff there who you know, used to climb on the wall. But you know there was you know I pulled pulled the route off that uh, that he couldn't. Had you been um, a climber previously, or is this all crawling no. pattern and you wanted to test yourself? Uh, so this this was 2017 still. I'd, I'd done a bit of climbing between 2003 and 2005, uh, outdoor rock climbing, mm-hmm. uh, and then done little bits and bobs of, uh, of indoor climbing, but I, I hadn't done for, for about five years at least. Mm-hmm. You know, So I, I did have a, an idea. You know, um, it, it, it wasn't, you know, but it wasn't magic, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's amazing. So you go on this cruise, you're able to then do the rock climbing. And then from there, what, what, what happened? Uh, found out that I could drink again as well. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't had a beer up until that point. And, and on the cruise, um, I could have a few. And I realized that, that the brain injury uh, sort of mask a hangover. I, I wouldn't notice it because it was a bigger problem, you know. But then I've, I've got better, and it feels like I've lost the superpower now. <laughs> I, can, I can get hangovers again. <laughs> so you come home. When when was your post op appointment? What what were they thinking? Uh, I had I had a six week occupational therapy residential visit, and they come out and they were they were amazed. We're checking the records to see if they got the the right bloke. Um, and they said, look, there's, there's not really much more we can, we can do for you. Mm-hmm. Just carry on doing what you're doing. And then my next t- touch point was actually a six month follow up. Um, Did with, they ask uh, many questions? 
The OT or the, the six month follow up that was with me, Surgeon. Uh, six month one. Either, both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the, the, the OT ones uh, did, didn't really. I, I, I thought they might want to engage about it. Mm-hmm. But um, no. I, they're busy people as well, though, like, you know. But the, the, the surgeon was, um, he, he, first of all, he, he was just, you know, quite routine and focused. Um, and then when I showed him some videos of what I've been doing, he, he said the, the only reason he believed it was because he was the surgeon and he knew the time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he said, because I showed him the, the, the videos from the cruise and the climbing, he, he said, if you told another neurosurgeon that, that that was 10 weeks after having 10 and a half hours of uh, brainstem surgery, and the brainstem, that's a key, key bit. It's not, not any old brain injury, it's a brainstem injury. Right. <laughs> you know, um, he, he said they, they'd laugh at you. He said they, they would not believe that. And I said, and that's also off the back of a, of a brainstem hemorrhage as well. Uh, so he, he was... He was blown away by it. And that, the video which you, you've seen, um, he, he asked me to create that. He was going to a, um, a neurosurgery conference in Malaysia. So we, I put that together for him. And had, unfortunately, I had, a, I had a friend in the, in the US who had um, brain surgery. And he asked me to, to send the video over to him. So it was too big for email. So I, I put it on my Facebook photos. Uh, and I didn't realize that when you do that, it post it everyone <laughs> yeah and so then within three days i had about ten thousand views on it <laughs> I'd, I'd imagine so it, it's it is an incredible story um so the the rounding out that year i know you were an avid runner um yeah. were you you know were you're walking you're climbing what what other activities did you uh did you pick up first um i i, I tried to, to get into just sort of expansive mobility Routines, you know, um, Mike Fitch with with Animal Flow, mm-hmm. and that, that's something I've come to a little bit more latterly, not in that first year, but that was the the sort of flavour of things I wanted to do. What my sort of strategy was was establish the basics in in each of the primary patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you've established that that basic, you move on to the next, but then also stay within that previous one and and try for a more expansive implementation of it. So, for instance, you go from baby crawling to what I term a Spider-Man crawl, mm-hmm. um, and then there's a there's a variation from that, which I, I saw Ido Portal doing. I imagine you're familiar with him. No? Uh, no. <laughs> no I, I, don't there. <laughs> I will definitely look him up, though, if you say yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the, the movement skills on, on that guy are, are, are incredible. Um, and th- there's a... There's a bit of a fashion at the minute, isn't there, for sort of animal movement. And you, you, you see some ridiculous things of people, you know, just fashioning something which is, is, is difficult to achieve mm-hmm. and then sticking, you know, sticking an animal label on. I guess it, it's a gerbil walk or, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, or a badger hop. Um, so, it, you know, I was trying some of the animal stuff. Um and yeah, you know, that's how I went. I did. I did try to, to foster the, the the running because I could get some sort of shuffle out. And, mm-hmm. But I thought this this is is going to do me as much harm as good. I'm just going to program. I'm going to become yeah. resilient to a bad pattern, which I, I don't want to be. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm still sort of there now. I haven't gone back to, to sort of regular distance running. I'm I'm doing interval. Uh, running, just trying to work on me, on me technique. Uh, I mean, one of the things is as well, a, a significant deficit was my ability to, to multitask. As a woman, you're probably just saying there's another <laughs> bloke who can't multitask. <laughs> I mean, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the level of stuff I was talking about, it was, you know, just like walking and talking at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so the, the information processing challenge of running meant that the moment I started trying to run, uh, I would lose a lot of vision quality. I would lose oh. peripheral vision. Uh, visual acuity would go. I would get distorted vision early doors. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I took running out of my program. Mm-hmm. And it's been 
all gym-based movements, uh, expansive mobility. Uh, monkey bars was a was a, a, a great milestone for me. I was delighted when I when I could do that. I used to be sort of okay on the monkey bars, not not sick the Soleil stuff, but just for, for Joe Bloggs, you know, I can mm-hmm. progress forward, progress back to the double hand hops and, and that. You know, once I could just do a standard sort of swing and monkey bars, I was mm-hmm. I was delighted. I, I was a big issue, mostly about focusing getting that attack fear again as I as I reach for the next one. And fear of failure coming into it and being able to get out of my own way on on that. So where are you now? You know, we've gone through that first year. It's been, you know, almost uh, four years right around this time period. Um, so, you know, what what's what's on what's in the future for Steve and what's kind of what's happening presently? Well, I mean, it was after about after about two years. I, I just it, it, I was just back into almost like a, a normal training approach, whereas there's always something that you're working on mm-hmm. in your training. Either something you're trying to get better with, uh, a pattern you're trying to sort out, uh, an injury you're working about around or trying to rehab. And so I, I quite rapidly fell into that and didn't really sort of consider myself as a, as a specific rehab thing. I was just doing, you know, everything anyone else would to, to improve their movement quality. It's just that it was obviously progressing. It was a bit more challenged in some areas. I mean, I still have balance issues now. I can can be hijacked sometimes. And if, if things speeded up or if I started moving quicker, mm-hmm. um, a, a real good tool I, I use with playing table tennis because it, it gets the brain thinking really quickly and you react mm-hmm. in really quickly and integrating movements with speed. But you're not moving your body around too much, you know, until you start getting to a really high level, I suppose. But even then, they don't move that much. It's, you know, you're, you're quite stationary and it's all upper torso and arms. And so that really started bringing me on, especially me. I mean, just driving was, was a new experience and just that built more neuroplasticity. So all of that was moving me on. But then the moment I start moving quickly, as in with, with the running, that was where the big challenge was. Now, now that is starting to change now. Um, I'm doing doing barefoot running drills uh, on hill in- intervals, just just working on the technique and doing the barefoot, trying to get as, as much neurological information flowing through right. the system as possible because that, that's where the, the neuroplasticity blossoms. Is it, it, it just getting new, expansive quality information in there. Mm-hmm. Now, so, are these experimental things that you're just kind of picking up or thinking, well, maybe I'll try table tennis, or was this something that happened by chance? The, the table tennis, uh, I would go up and visit my dad in, in Liverpool, and he was playing uh, table tennis. Um, <coughs> one second. That's one of my last deficits that the, the brain stem controls, um, controls airway and functions like coughing and sneezing. So I, I've you know, I, I'm troubled clearing my airway and, and I can't, can have coffin fix, which makes you so attractive in this current climate <laughs> with the COVID and that, like, you know, don't worry, it's a brain injury, honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's so I, I went up with my dad and he, he plays, uh, he was playing table tennis. I mean, my me, me dad's going to be 80 this year, but he mm-hmm. plays tennis three times a week, golf twice, and was playing table tennis when, you know, before the lockdown. Uh, stopped it. So um, I would go down and I'd uh, play table tennis with him. And if, if he watches this, he, he won't forgive me if I don't tell you that he beats me. <laughs> <laughs> On occasion. <laughs> I really want to say thank you for having this, you know, telling the story today because, again, it's it's really impressive. Um, I know the guys are going to have a lot of questions and it's going to be a great conversation with everyone um, as well. So that'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.